I understand that you were initially inspired to write what you did from Lord of the Rings. What was it that inspired you from that? It's a little more complex than that, actually. Okay. Uh, I was actually inspired to write, the, use the form of the Lord of the Rings to write the story. But uh, I had been reading, like most writers, for a very long time and uh, had fallen under the spell of the European adventure story writers first in my teens, moved on when I went, in to, went to university to uh, William Faulkner, an American writer who wrote in the kind of format that uh, the Shannara series is written in, where there's a, in a much smaller space with one county and families and generations of families and secrets destroying families and the change in, in the world destroying them as well, uh, so that the have-nots became rapacious and the, became the haves and so forth. So that and then the format of The Lord of the Rings using the fantasy world, because uh, I didn't read fantasy growing up because boys in the 40s and 50s didn't read fantasy, they read science fiction. Yes, like science, me, I read. Yes, like all of us, really. Every, every writer I know, well, I grew up reading science fiction if, it, if you grew up in those days because that's what was exciting and nobody was really doing much fantasy. So that's, that's the long answer to the short question. <laughs> uh, how do you... Um, <clears throat> When you're creating these new worlds, um, what inspires you to create them? Do you find it sort of they come alive to you? Or? It's a very good question after my writing these books for almost 50 years. Um, and, you know, I never dreamed I would still be doing this uh, at this stage of my writing career if I was lucky enough to have any kind of a writing career. Uh, but th that's one of the things you don't think about when you're starting out. But uh, I, ha I thought about it enough to say, well, okay. Um, I know how I need to structure this uh, so that I don't burn out early because it, all too frequently writers burn out mm -hmm. and then their material drops off and everybody yeah. says, well, you know, what happened to the real so-and-so. Uh, so I went to generational sagas and I went to uh, new storylines and a different world from, from one set of books to the next and that really helped. But the whole thing about why you, why you keep, how you keep from burning out and being excited about your work each time out, because if you're going to give a year, let's say, which is about what I give now to a book, uh, you have to really be enmeshed in the story or about halfway through or three quarters of the way through. You just want to finish it, you know, and you can never do that because readers are very sharp. They, they, know. Know. they yeah, know. You pick they it up, know. you know, oh, oh I'm just trying to know. finish this <clears> now. Just exactly right. Mm -hmm. So... Um, for me, it's been easy. I, I, I read the newspapers um, and I listen to the radio, not so much television, but uh, uh, and there's always something irritating me, always. Uh, and uh, I find that being irritated uh, tends to stay with you uh, if it's a subject uh, that is far reaching and not uh, just an indiv individual concern. So those kinds of things uh, are the things that keep me interested enough in the storyline and, and able to power into a storyline in a way that I don't lose interest partway through because it's always an exploration. You know, it's reflecting do, those things that are irritating. Yeah, you know, I think it through and I think, how do I feel about this? And I reach that solution by writing it out through the characters who respond to it. Maybe it's about the environment. Maybe it's about uh, manipulation and, and moral ambiguity, uh, but those kinds of subjects, which are universal really, uh, are questions that I find people not only relate to, but are looking for answers. So you give them a scenario and you give them some people's responses to them, and it works for both them and me. Mm. That's the advantage of sci-fi and, and fantasy, that yeah. you can reflect the current world. Yes. Uh, and, and get a message Bring across. Outcome, yeah. I think most mm. writers do that, the mm. good writers do that. I think that you know they're operating on one level where they have a, a surface story that involves a quest, that involves a little band of heroes, that involves whatever, uh, or it's an urban story of, of some sort. But it also touches base with what everybody knows to be true about the world and it, it concerns itself yes. with issues that are relevant not only to now but sometimes to what might happen down the road. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that I think you're pretty safe uh, when, you, when you focus a story on those things. Well, a lot of the um, drama writers, or as opposed to sci-fi fantasy writers, tend to feel that it's more comfortable to be able to attack issues head-on in fantasy and sci-fi mm -hmm. rather than in the real world, which can be a bit touchy. Mm -hmm. 
Thing. Well, and there's always concerns about that. Uh, you know, you, you don't think about that either when you start out. You know, when you're a young writer, you're just trying to get something published, right? You're, what can I write that somebody would want to read? You know, and you don't have any roadmap. And when I was writing, there weren't even any conferences or schools or barely any classes in anything besides expository writing. I didn't know any writers. I didn't know anybody in the publishing business. No roadmap at all. Uh, so uh, you kind you kind of have to find your way there, and um, that's that's tricky business. Uh, and you once you have written something that's successful, uh, which is wonderful, like I did with Sword, and it was so successful, unfortunately, bang, there you are. And right away, these are the lines that you have to color within, or you disappoint your readers. Yes. Now I'm not saying you're hidebound to do this no matter what, but you're certainly aware of it, and you're certainly aware that you can't suddenly go off and write, you know, Fifty Shades of Shannara. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, so you, you're sticking with, you know, with what got you there, and, and my editor was quick to tell me that when I wrote something a little bit different. He says, that's very nice, and I put that away for, you know, when... The money making uh, Yeah, <laughs> and you go back to what you're writing now, which is successful, because publishers, you know, if it's sold once, it'll sold twice, and they don't like it when you suddenly go off and do something else. Yeah, stick, so to you, stick to the formula. Stick to the formula. So that's more of the thing. You stick to the formula, but you have to find ways to reinvent the wheel, too, so you don't just write the same story over and over again, because people don't like that, either. They like some repetition, but they don't want too much. Do you find the publishers pushed you? Because a number of the writers, as you said earlier, uh, their books tend to decline in quality as the years go on, and I often wonder whether that's because publishers are pushing them to generate another book faster. Uh, yeah, uh, publishers are always pushing you to write the same thing and write it quicker. Always. Uh, because this is a business. and. You come to understand very early, it's, uh, it's economics, it's about money. You know, yeah. yes, art is important, and yes, we want art, but we also, mostly, it's about selling. If it doesn't sell, goodbye. These days, particularly, you know, as a new writer, you probably get a contract for two books. If the first book sells good, if the second book sells better, all right. If it doesn't, eh, yeah. you know, maybe not. <laughs> it's goodbye. Uh, so, and it's, it was somewhat that way. I had a long learning uh, curve, because in those days, uh, they hung up with a, a, a new writer for a longer period of time. So I, and I had the same editor for the first four books, five books, I guess it was. Um, and he was, he was a, a mentor and a teacher. And uh, that was immensely necessary for a new writer who kind of stumbled into success without really understanding why. And uh, you need that. And uh, so, you know, that's real, I think that's really important. Is yeah, that well, going somewhere with this? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the Fellowship of Australian Writers introduced an award recently, well, not recently, years ago, to credit the role of the editor. Yeah. Because we're finding the role of the editor is actually diminishing. Yes. And in the process of getting the book out there faster, it's let's skip the editing process because it's an extra cost. You finding that? A, you know? Oh, that's absolutely true. When I always started out, when I was a boy, or not a boy, but a young young writer in the 70s, beginning in the 70s and early 80s, the editors called the shots. They called the shots, and the publishing people basically went along with what the editors decided. Now that is not the case. And while they still solicit creative content and try to find the best books and so forth, they have less and less of a role in the editorial field and more and more promotional, marketing, things like that. And the marketing department has risen in the esteem of the publishing houses. And so it, it, the, the whole format has changed to a certain extent. And a lot of it is because all the conglomerate, all the publishing houses now, uh, except for the university presses, are conglomerates. You know, they're mm -hmm. big, multi-dimensional, multimedia corporations. Yeah. So, you know, they, they've got their hands in a half a dozen different types of creativity and uh, so it's not just books it's it's many other things Whoa, yeah. think Amazon uh, so mm -hmm. yeah you know it's a little bit different I think you know getting back to your earlier question uh, as a writer you have to be aware of the fact uh, that you have to find ways uh, to keep your profile up there because now everything gets dumped back on the writer to a great yeah. extent I mean we're doing our own publicity now I run my own shop. I run my own publicity shop. I run my own website, my own Facebook page. I have a guy that does this for me. The publisher says, anything we can do to help, let us know. <laughs> Which okay. is nothing. Yeah. Well, mostly. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Do you have a writing process? Like get up at start nine and finish at five or word, word limit per day or anything like that? Flat. Well, before I hit 70, I had a really good one that was tight and firm and, and <laughs> true. Now I'm sort of lackadaisical about the whole thing. Uh, it's my retirement year, supposedly. 
So uh, I just know that uh, I'm fresh at 6 a.m., ready to go, and by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm brain dead. Yeah. So, you know, knowing this, uh, I don't work nights and weekends anymore. I don't have another job. Uh, that changes things. Kids are all grown up. Grandkids are all grown up. Um, it's just me and Judine, and so it changes the way you approach things. And if you're, uh, you know, if you, if you can uh, function that way and change, then you probably should. So I, I look at what works for me, and uh, my process used to be very uh, tight. I used to outline everything firmly. Uh, I would uh, I would work up character profiles. I would do time frames. I would do all that wow. that preparatory stuff before I ever sat down to write a word. I knew the story before I wrote it. I knew the characters in my head. After a while, that gets a little on the boring side. So you say, well, you know, I, w I would change it even back then because you, you always change based on what you're doing, right? You, you just get better ideas. You get better insights as you write. The writing tells you what the story needs to be. Now I think I'm more inclined to say, I think I'll write a story about this subject. Here's a couple characters that would work well in this story. Um, you know, I'm looking at maybe 400 pages. Uh, yeah. I think I'll Just start here. I know what the I know what I want to say, so I know what the ending should be. But all that in between stuff, I tend to meander around more than I used to in some ways. Sometimes it comes more fully formed than others. Uh, sometimes it's a little more amorphous. But I think I trust the process enough now that it's okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it's but I know writers who. Mm, holy mackerel! They are so uber organized. I can hardly stand it. Make me look like a piker. <laughs> well, I know when I write, I tend to sort of have a skeleton. Yeah. And then as you write, you put the flesh on it. And it, My it makes it more interesting for yeah, me. Yeah, it does. And, and not only that, but I, as I was saying earlier, I think, and you may find this to be true, that r when you're writing it, it tells you what needs to happen. It always tells you better what needs to happen through the writing. And I always also know at the end of one book what the next book's going to be. Wow. Always. Mm -hmm. Without fail, it just tells me. It says, here's where you need to go next. Yeah. In there somewhere. Or maybe the ideas just form as you go along. I don't know. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's very useful. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, that's right. I finish the I book and then I have the, oh, where am I going to go next? <laughs> <What's good? laughs> yeah, that's lucky. Like that. I don't know. I've never wanted to be anything but a writer. I mean, I knew when I was 10 I was going to be a writer. Well, had no clue well. how to get there. No clue at all. Found Which means you're one of those that probably could never stop writing. I am. That's mm. true. I will die with my boots on and my fingers on the keyboard. Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. I think that's one of the markers of a, of a true writer is that you can't stop. Even if you never sold a book in your life, you can't stop writing. Well, if you were to ask Judine, she would say, if he is not writing for a while, he gets really owly. Crazy and horrible. At least, yeah, sometimes yeah. even worse. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you're, just, you're not complete without you know, participating in the process in some fashion. And that's, that's very much true about me. Hmm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> now you, uh, I noticed there was a quote on about you finding short stories very restrictive in the way they're writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in my own writing, I find that I started with short stories, but mm -hmm. they tended to get longer and longer and longer <laughs> and longer. <laughs> now I can't write a short story. Yeah, right. I find it too restrictive. Well, so, there you are. Uh, there you are. So you got a similar sort of situation. Yeah, you know, I started with uh, well, I of course published big novels to start with. The first one was what seven hundred and some pages. The second was six, almost seven hundred pages. Um, so I, I've always felt more comfortable with that form. Um, and to write a short story, uh, a true short story, is very hard for me because I can't figure out how to boil it all down and tell it in, you know, 20 pages or something like that. My short stories tend to be 50, you know, that's about as good as I can, I can make it. So it's, it's, it always turned out to be an enormous amount of work and I always end up putting, uh, I don't know, you know, four to six weeks into a short story, which seems unduly long for something like that, when I can write a whole book in about six months or eight months. <laughs> so yeah, I, I struggle with them. I don't, I don't like them because of the fact I have to work so hard to make it come out the way I would like yeah. it to. Yeah, you also said um, apparently that reading your books in chronological order is not the best way to read them. I've said a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and my question we shouldn't would believe be, everything. <laughs> well, that's why I asked. See? I, I do feel it's extremely important for somebody who reads my books to read all 35 of them. Really. Yeah. They should read them all. In fact, every man, woman, and child in the United States definitely should read them all. But it is a work. 
It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I don't know. I just figure I write in 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 segments anyway. So it, because they're generational, there are big gaps of time between one set of books and the next set. So really, nobody needs to start with way back here at the first one. You could just jump in at something that interests you. Read two, three, four books and see how you feel. And then if you don't like it, then you can let it go and it's okay. And you can skip around, and a lot of people do. So each one stands alone. Each set stands alone, but they're in a set of three trilogies, of course, we all write trilogies, it seems like, uh, yeah, sets well, of four, sets of whatever the set is with the overarching title, then there uh, you should start with book one and read it through. Okay. That said, somebody's always coming in and saying, I just read you know, book two of so-and-so, what a great book. And I said, well, did you know what was going on at that point? He said, oh, sure. Then I went back and read book one, and I'm always thinking, I don't, I think I could do that. No, I need not. But people will fool you about that, and they seem to be okay with it. So I don't, I don't worry about it.